Okay. So, uh, sorry about that uh, little break. So, um, we're talking about uh, fabrication of flexures now. Um, okay. So, uh, how do you fabricate flexures and compliant mechanisms? Well, usually you have to make them in planar pieces and then assemble them. Okay. Of course, some designs are, can totally tolerate being planar. Some designs you can fabricate and then deform them in place, like laminar emergent mechanisms. And uh, you know, and, and some some designs uh, through origami, kirigami can, like I said, turn 3D from 2D things. But other times you just have to make in separate parts and assemble them or 3D print them. Okay. So let, let's look at um, famous planar approaches to make your your parts that you'll you'll assemble, and then we, we'll talk about 3D printing as well. So. Possibly the best way to make flexures for high precision flexures with really small features like little thin wire flexures, um, which are typically cut out of metal, right? Because metal is typically the best way to make flexures, what material to make flexures out of. Um, uh, and so you use wire uh, EDM. So it's, it's electric discharge machining is what EDM stands for. And essentially what you do is you take a... Um, you take your material, this is like zoomed in so the surface here is really rough, and you take a wire and you put a giant uh, battery on this, it would create a giant voltage between these. And of course this material has to be conductive and the wire has got to be conductive. And as you bring the wire toward the material, at some point, it's, it's literally like lightning, you know, you create a giant voltage potential and um, the air in between, it gets close enough that the voltage potential gets so high that it, uh, it, it, it um, uh, you know, the, the, the atoms are stripped from it, it ionizes, and electricity suddenly flows to complete the circuit in like a giant burst of, of lightning, essentially. So that, that's literally how lightning happens in the sky. So the giant voltage potential, the air ionizes, and then, and then down comes the huge bolt of lightning. And, and these lightning bolts are like way hotter than the surface of the sun, you know. So, so anytime this happens, you get a lot of, a lot of power. And, and so... Um, you can essentially vaporize the surface. So if it, with, with wire EDM, what you have to do is, is drill little holes and thread the, the wire, and then you, 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 you pull it through the machine, and it, uh, it cuts the, the metal like butter. Okay? Um, the kerf is, is essentially meaning, meaning like what is, the, what is the thinnest you can cut it. Uh, that's what the kerf is. It's, it's, of course, limited by the diameter of the wire. Um, and usually, like the smallest wires you can get is like 0.1 millimeter wires. Um, so that's about, you know, so that's pretty darn good kerf. <coughs> the accuracy is also really good. It's, it's like 5 micron or smaller. Okay. And the surface finish is, is submicron. And the reason is, is because there's like a, um, uh, the surface finish is amazing with wire EDM because uh, there's just a passive, um, kind of natural reason the surface gets leveled. And that's because, like, imagine you have this bumpy surface here. Whatever, of course, the electricity takes the path of least resistance, the shortest path. And so whatever is sticking out the furthest gets vaporized the soonest. And the second it, like, it vaporizes and gets smaller and smaller, suddenly if the next one gets taller than it or sticks out further, then it starts getting vaporized. So it, it's like this... Um, nice passive feedback loop that uh, just because electricity takes the route of, of least resistance, it just levels the surface and makes it very nice, level, and smooth. Okay? So that's how it has an amazing surface finish. Um, there's no direct contact. The wire never actually touches the material. Just the electricity jumps and vaporizes it. Okay? So that's really good. Um, so there's no, like, work hardening or anything of the material. Um, and it can handle very delicate features. Yeah, like you wouldn't believe how you know sub millimeter flexure blades that are can be fairly thick uh, can be made with with virtually no taper, um, it, and it's really impressive. So um, n now uh, you can achieve three D features. You can take your wire and you can angle it and move it. Um, you can also use like dies that um, instead of a wire you can you can. Uh, uh, you know, have a, an entire shaped die and press it into something, but use the same principle to, to vaporize it uh, using electricity. Um, and so you can get some neat things with, with wire EDM and, and just EDM, electric discharge machines in, in general. Um, 
Okay, the negatives of this is it can be very slow. First of all, you have to drill a bunch of holes for every closed loop inside that you want to cut. You have to drill the hole and then thread the wire and then it takes a while to cut it. it this does not cut quickly. Um, it's also very expensive. Uh, you, you pay a pretty penny for wire EDM compared to the other planar approaches. Um, you, of course, get what you pay for, but it's, it's, it's very expensive. Um, huge power consumption draws a lot of power and the parts are required to be conductive. You can't do this with something that doesn't conduct electricity, of course. Uh, so, it's, um, so metal uh, that conducts is, is pretty much what it's limited to, which is fortunate because metal flexures generally require metal. So most high-end flexures are made with wire EDM. That's why I listed it first. Okay? Another great approach, though, is water jet. Okay? This, is, um, uh, this, this can cut very impressive features. Um, uh, the, the way it works, by the way, is, um, you know, you have, it's basically like a, a, a water gun on steroids. A huge pressurized tank of water sprays out water very powerfully to the point it could cut your arm off, right? Um, and, and easily, right? So it, it cuts through metal is how much pressure you're spraying this water with. But it has a little help. It's got like a little feed with little stuff called garnet. It's like little sharp sand particles that get sucked in with the water. So it blasts water in these sharp particles to help it cut smoother. Um, but it could just cut with water, you know, but, but it, it cuts better with the garnet. Um, and, uh, and, and you, anyway, you blast through things and, and you, you cut things out with this. And it's, it's computer controlled, of course. Um, you'd be surprised. It, it cuts much faster than wire EDM. So first of all, you don't have to drill anything. It punches its own holes and it cuts its own thing. And it's, it's very rapid. Okay, so it, um, right, it, it, it can cut inches per minute. Um, you can watch it cut a whole flexure just as you stand there um, in, a, in a short time. So that's a, a real plus. Um, uh, let's see, many materials including brittle, heat-sensitive, non-conductive materials. So it doesn't matter what the material is made of. It's going to blast through it with water, right? So whether it's a polymer, whether it's a metal, anything. Now, of course, if it's a brittle material and you blast it with water, you can shatter it but you can get around that by sandwiching it between two ductile materials and, and clamp it together and cut through the whole thing all together. That helps brittle materials not shatter um, with the water. But so the brittle materials are totally possible. Thermal is not an issue, heat sensitive, nothing. It doesn't have to conduct, it's just, you just blast through it with water, right? And it's comparatively low cost. cost. We're just talking about water and garnet. You can, you know, you could reuse the garnet, but you probably wouldn't want to because it loses its sharpness. Um, but, uh, I mean, look, garnet's like sand, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty low cost. Um, so that's good, and it's, it's fast, and, and you can get pretty thin flexures. Um, nowhere near the thinness of wire EDM, though. Well, I guess near, but, but wire EDM, you, you can tell a day and night difference between something water jet and wire EDM'd. Um, it's not nearly as good. The kerf is greater than a millimeter. That's like the thinnest. Of course, it's determined by the water jet stream. You get these nasty draft angles, though. So, you know, you can imagine as the water loses momentum, it has to spread out. And so it kind of cuts a draft. And instead of wire EDM, it just cuts straight down with super impressive service finish. This actually gives a nasty taper. So if you, if you cut something really thick, um, you know, it, it, the taper gets worse and worse. And you can, if you cut a thin flexure, the top might look good and the bottom is just looks all ripped up and, and it's a real problem. So, you know, draft angle taper is a problem. Again, uh, you know, not a problem if you make it thin enough, but the thicker, the more problems you have. The accuracy is like 125 microns, which isn't uh, terribly great. Um, so there, there are some problems with it, but this is a nice go-to for cheap flexures that are made of metal um, or, you know, any material, right? But um, uh, right, and so, so th they've advanced water jets substantially since I made this slide. There's five-axis water jets where they can angle the jet and by so doing can eliminate uh, or, or help mitigate taper and can even cut, uh, you know, 3D kind of uh, structures. Um, and they even have a micro water jet now uh, where, they have, where they've gotten the jet much smaller and much more accurate and it, it's starting to approach the capabilities of wire EDM. But again, the machine is very expensive now, so, so, um, uh, but to use it is cheaper than the wire EDM and it certainly doesn't draw as much power. So anyway, you can look into that, look into micro water jets and five axis water jets. It, it's, it's really coming along. 
um, and, and can, can be competitive with wire EDM okay. uh, when you get on the high end. Okay, laser cutting um, is another great tool. Okay, basically what you do is you, it's like a lightsaber. You just focus a laser with really high power and it, it melts through things and can cut them. Okay, most Christmas ornaments you see are cut with laser cutters. Um, you can, but you can, you, you can cut things beyond just wood, of course. You can cut metals with enough power. You can punch through almost anything, right? But um, uh, it's very rapid. If you ever watch a, a laser cutter, it's much faster than even uh, water jet. Um, it just zips around. Um, very quickly, you can see the laser zipping around. Uh, look up some videos on YouTube. You can see how it works. Um, so, uh, you, know, I, you know, inches per minute, I would say, is a good thing. It's accuracy. It's pretty darn good. It's, you know, and the kerf is like 25 microns. Um, it's determined by how, you know, much you can focus the laser, which is, um, you know, diffraction limited. Uh, but, uh, you know, you know so, that, but that's, so that, that's, that's all very impressive, right? Um, the downside is, is you are limited in material, okay? So, like, you wouldn't want to use a laser cutter on a mirror, okay? Something that's reflective because you take all that power and it'll just bounce right back in your eye. It's not going to cut the mirror, okay? So, if it's highly reflective, you don't want to cut it with a laser cutter. It'll just reflect all the light, right? Um, and then if it's highly thermally conductive or high thermal diffusivity, then as it tries to dump the heat in it to melt it, to cut it, if, this, if the heat just spreads out super fast, then, then you won't cut through it. It'll just heat up the entire chunk of material until, you know, and so, so like that wouldn't be good, right? But other than that, uh, you can pretty much cut through anything with enough power uh, with a laser. Um, it does take large power consumption, so that's a, that's a downside. Uh, it does have thickness limitations. Um, and if you think about it, as the laser focuses, it comes in with an angle, it focuses, then it goes out with an angle. So it does create a taper because um, you can't have the focal spot be, uh, you know, at every location along its thickness. So you, what you do is do multiple paths, and after each pass, you can lower the focal point uh, to try and get it the best possible. But, um, uh, you know, there's... Anyway, there, there's going to be some tapers, and, and you'll see burns around the edge sometimes. Materials can burn. Um, there's the thermal effects, the HAS, the HAS region, the heat-affected zone. Um, you can imagine, you know, like, yeah, if, if, you, if it has really high thermal conductivity in the material, then the whole thing will just heat up and the thing won't, won't uh, melt to cut. But uh, reverse, if it has too low of a thermal conductivity, so no heat dissipates, then you get uh, tons of heat at a concentrated location, which is normally good because it could melt and cut through. But like if you have high thermal expansion coefficient material, then that heat will bulge dramatically at that place. And you can get f cracking and crummy surfaces. And, you know, depending on what you cut, if you cut polymers and various things, you can see it all burned and messed up at the edges. But, um, you know, and it gives the wood a nice uh, smoky a dark uh, edge and stuff. So, you know, anyway, just things to be aware of with uh, laser cutting. But it's a great, great technology for cutting um, flexures of all sorts, polymer, wood, or uh, metal, if you've got a powerful enough laser cutter. Okay. Uh, milling. Okay, you can mill stuff out. You can mill it. You can CNC mill it if you want even more flexibility. In this case, there's, you can cut almost any material, right? Um, there, it certainly doesn't need to be conductive. If you're careful, you can even cut brittle materials, but careful, you're, you're, you're slamming into the surface and cutting it, so uh, you could easily break it. So um, you, know, you may have limitations with it being brittle, but um, you, you can cut almost any material. You can get almost any shape with CNC. Um, Multi-axis, you know, five-axis, you can cut three-dimensional shapes and do interesting things. And it's very flexible, you know, like... Um, Flexible meaning you can cut almost any part you want and it, with no added cost to the system. You know, it's not like you, you know, well, you'll see with lithography we're about to do, um, you pay a lot for a mask and, and you can only make one thing. And if you want to change one thing about that mask, you have to redesign the whole thing. It's not like that with CNC or milling. You can cut whatever you want. So it's, it's flexible and it, it's, it's very compatible with lots of material. So you can do it by hand or you can have the computer do it right with CNC. Okay, but the negatives of this is you can get, um, there's very high forces. So unlike wire EDM, uh, I mean, you've got, there, there's definitely service contact, not just service contact, but there's 
like sharp blades rotating around digging the material out. And, and so like good luck making thin flexure blades out of metal. Like it will damage the surface. You'll, you'll likely br bla break the flexure blades. Although you'd be surprised what can be made. And there's micro mills, by the way, that can cut very delicately, very small features. So, you know, you can make some pretty impressive flexures, but uh, it, it's, it's hard, okay? Uh, you get surface damage, uh, work hardening, right? Because you're, you're digging out the material uh, with, the, the, with the mill. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, you can strain harden it, it's, it's change the material properties at the surface, which might change the flexures properties. So uh, the material may have the properties you want, but now you've strain hardened the surface by damaging it. And now it has uh, an effective properties that maybe aren't, aren't desirable. Um, fixturing is also an issue uh, as you hold it fixed, um, right? Uh, you have to clamp it somewhere to withstand these large forces, so that, that can be difficult. And if you're repositioning, it can be tricky, okay? So, but lots of great flexures are milled, okay? Polymer and metal, they're, they're milled. Okay, so if you want to make things really small, um, some of the most popular ways to do it is microfabrication in, in, a, in a clean room, right? Um, and using like lithography or etching, okay? So most little MEMS devices, the ones in the projector are made with this way. They're, they're just starting to be able to 3D print tiny little uh, MEMS devices and that's, that's starting to be a thing, but still right now the most popular way to do it and certainly the way to do it with materials uh, that are good flexure materials like silicon, which is what most wafers are made of. Silicon's a pretty good flexure material. It's of course brittle, uh, it can snap, but it, it's not a bad flexure material. So. You can make some nice flexure MEMS devices here. You can see Larry Howell, my professor, Col Col Marty Culpepper, Sri Dakota, you know, many people do this. Um, the way it works is you get a wafer, you assume there's contaminants on it, so you, you wash away the contaminants, you, you flush it, you coat it, spin coat it with photoresist, okay? And then you, you get a mask, you have to order a mask, design a mask, which is basically like a sheet with, um, blacked out areas and, and light areas so light gets blocked and other light can go through. And so now you shine the light and the, the parts that's transparent that can go through, it, it uh, either hardens or softens the photoresist depending on what kind of photoresist it is. And then when you've done that, uh, you take away the mask, you wash away, in this case say this softened it so you can wash those away. If it was hardening photoresist, you'd wash away everything else um, and leave those. And then you put it in a plasma etching uh, thing and the plasma basically, it, you know, it, it can't etch through the, 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 the coating here, but it goes underneath and, and etches uh, away at the silicon. And it does so with very specialized angles, uh, draft angles and stuff, but you can, you can cut into material uh, this way chemically essentially on tiny scales. Okay, and then you wash away the photoresist and you got the part. Now this is of course a yucky part, but um, say you want to cut through the whole thing. And by the way, here's the, what the machines look like. Um, and they use very dangerous chemicals that are very toxic and can kill you upon touching and stuff. So you got to be careful and wear, wear your bunny suit and be in special rooms that, uh, you know, are lit right and are very clean and everything. Okay, so another approach that kind of takes us to another level is deep reactive ion etching, okay, or DRIE. And you basically continue the same process that I just showed you for this to get this, this little edge. But what you can then do is recode everything, including this top surface, and then blast it with another plasma so that, yes, it takes this away a little bit, it takes that away, cuts in there, but it doesn't fully get through this. Then you recode it, blast it again, and you just repeat this process till you can dig super deep like you're milling or something. And that's how you make all these, these things. You can punch all the way through the silicon and, and make, these, uh, make these little MEMS devices, okay? Uh, one downside to this is you're left with this sca scallop uh, artifact uh, of each la level layer that you, uh, you know, etched. Okay, and they're like 100 to 500 nanometers in amplitude, these uh, scallops. Okay, so what are the positives of this? Well, you can do 2D and 2.5D topologies. Like by stacking layers very cleverly and etching things cleverly, you can get overhanging features, and that's why it says it's not full 3D, it's uh, two and a half D, okay? Um, uh, you can cut monolithic uh, devices, 
Okay, that means, you know, you, you can make it a single piece, so you don't have to assemble anything, which is really nice on small scales. Uh, it's a real pain to assemble stuff, so you cut it all out of a single piece. And you can get micron level features, like you can get flexures, you know, 10 microns or, or even smaller, okay? Um, depending on your skill and mask alignment and stuff, okay? The negatives to this is it's very slow, okay? Um, very slow, microns per minute. Um, and it takes an immense amount of skill and chemistry. Uh, you know, you have to really master your chemistry. Um, and it's, it's not flexible at all. If you design something, you want to change something about the design, you have to redesign your mask and possibly even get different chemistries and, and reorder a mask that, to shine the light through and everything. So it's not flexible. Um, poor dimensional control, like your, your, you know, the taper angle very much is dependent on the chemistry you use to etch it. And um, it's really an art. It takes many iterations to get it right for most mechanisms, except with extreme uh, experience. And then for DRA, you got scallops and other things. But you know, it used to be the only option for making MEMS devices on small scales with materials that are good for flexures. Okay, which are really, like I said, oftentimes the only kind of bearing option on a small scale. Because good luck making things small with this approach and then assembling them. And, and overcoming the surface forces and everything, you know, the intermolecular forces. It, it, it can be done, people have done it, but um, flexures are usually better. You'd only want to do that if you want continuous motion of a micro machine. Okay, then the final thing is 3D printing. Okay, this slide was made a long time ago. This is already, a lot of this is like outdated, but um, you know, 3D printing is the most flexible. You can print anything you can think of, you can print. I mean, this would, good luck machining this any other approach, this weird topology with holes in it and everything, you know. Um, any, anyway, 3D printing can get almost any, any geometry. Um, okay, um, multi-materials, uh, you know, there's 3D printers that can do multi-materials simultaneously, which is cool because you can do um, graded materials, you know, m most... Most things fail at the interface between two different materials uh, because the two materials have different properties. They usually, you know, they don't come together. They have to be joined together, and things fail at joints. And uh, you know, sometimes there's thermal expansion mismatches, and they, they break the material. So, wouldn't it be nice if you could seamlessly transition uh, one material into another and grade it? Um, then there'd be no joint to break at. And nature does this a lot, like a muscle's arm starts very rubbery and then stiffens, uh, you know, in a graded way along its, um, along its arm. So, so, you know, nature does that kind of stuff all the time. And that, that's within the realm of possibility of 3D printing. Uh, the downside is, is it, so I say here it's slow. I mean, it used to be slow. There's a lot of companies that are speeding it up pretty fast, but, it, you know, it's still fairly slow, right? Um, because you have to zip the nozzle around or or scan the light around um, if, you're, if you're curing things. There's all sorts of different ways 3D printing works, many different approaches to 3D printing. Um, but, uh, you know, they're all, you know, relatively slow, I would say. But, but the, again, they're, they're speeding it up much faster, so that's starting to be a positive, not a negative. Um, it's, it can be expensive. Well, that's another thing. 3D printing used to be really expensive. Now it's actually pretty darn cheap. So. Um, that's, that's not true, although if you still want to 3D print uh, metals like titanium, um, it can still be pretty expensive right, right now, but maybe in five years from now it's, it's going to be really cheap. Um, but that, they're working on it because um, of how disruptive it is, obviously. Um, so oftentimes you have to use support material if you have overhanging features and that support material needs to be removed um, and that can be a pain. Um, you, you can't really have floating islands. That, that's one, one thing that uh, is a limitation, um, of course, because materials can't defy gravity there. Um, resolution for a large print size is usually poor. Um, so there's like this trade-off with all 3D printing approaches. If you want to print a large thing, like take up a large volume, then you, you, you sacrifice your resolution. You're, you're not going to be able to print small features, right? But if you, but you can make tiny features, you know, with two photon lithography, you can print uh, features that are, you know, sub micron um, and, and get amazing resolution. But then the volume you can print is like sub millimeter cubed, you know, it's something tiny. And so um, the holy grail would be, can you figure out a 3D printing approach that you can print a giant chunk of material 
but with tiny resolutions so you can make these architected and mechanical metamaterials, 3D print them with multi-material and make tiny, tiny like nanometer beams uh, that constitute this giant meter cube chunk of material or larger. Uh, that's not possible yet, but people are working on that. But there's, there's that trend. The bigger volume you print, the, you're sacrificing resolution, unfortunately. Um, and usually the microstructure has inferior properties to bulk materials. So, you know, um, it's pretty tough to beat a forged material. You know, if you're forging a material, you, you, work, you heat and work treat it until you, you get uh, very impressive material properties just on the material scale. Um, but with 3D printing, you're depositing layers and fusing layers and uh, the materials, first of all, the properties tend to be anisotropic. They're, they're different in, in, in plane versus out of plane because you're depositing layers. And that's often not good. You, you want materials to be isotropic, so the same properties in all directions. Um, but it's also, um, you know, they, they have inferior properties. Now, people are working on that too. Uh, you know, they're starting to get properties that are comparable and sometimes looking even better than the bulk property, you know, of the natural material. So, so again, that's, that's something they're working on. Um, often as the material is porous, that's, that's sometimes true. It's not always true. Um, and currently the material selection is limited. Um, you know, it used to be it was just strictly polymers, but, uh, but now we're getting metals and ceramics and all sorts of uh, materials. Uh, you know, people can print tissue and organs and stuff um, that, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty impressive material selection. So all these negatives are being slowly eliminated um, with research. And when they are, you know, this is going to really disrupt the field of flexures because now it almost doesn't matter what your design is. You, you can, you know, you're not limited. Your designs aren't limited by what can be manufactured with 2D processes that are expensive. You could just 3D print, 3D designs, you know, and access way more interesting things. So um, 3D printing will very much disrupt compliant mechanisms and architected materials. So, okay, with that, that concludes our, the introduction for this course. Uh, please see the YouTube channel and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.